All right, let's go. I'm Thomas Torrey. And I'm Justin Moretto. And we made it to episode 10 without getting mixed up at all. Because he's really Justin and I'm really Thomas. Apparently, there is a statistic that eight out of nine podcasts never make it to a 10th episode. To celebrate, we're announcing that our podcast finally has a name. Drum roll, please. <gasps> what is it? Uh, it was. Oh, you had the name. I don't have the name. Did, did you look in your pocket? It's nothing. I <sighs> Check your pocket. I watched you put it in there. Next episode, we'll announce the name. Okay. I'm a filmmaker. I'm a scientist. And we're two friends who've made movies together. And launched a company together. And we lost our money. And our identity. But we are finding ourselves again. And this is our podcast. This is it. Welcome. In this episode, an update on Justin's novel sparks a discussion on agents. An update on Thomas's film leads to us invoking Buddha and Confucius. And then, a simple backyard fire pit redesign provokes us to rethink our cultural addiction to productivity. Aren't we deep thinkers today? Hey, we saved it all for the 10th episode special. All that and more. Hey, Justin, remember that time that we recorded for almost 45 minutes before I realized I never pressed record? You would never do that. Ever. You're right. I never did that. Definitely didn't happen this episode when we recorded. Now, I know also sort of new in your creative world is, you know, the completion of the second draft of your book, which I know because I read it and have given you notes. Mm -hmm. So does that mean you're starting the third draft? I, I, I'm curious of like, as a as an ongoing creative project for you, what, where do you feel like you are in the process of writing Bell States and like, what's next for it? What's What's the plan? Are you going to do a third draft and then submit it to try to get published? What does that look like? What is the timeline on that? What's the plan for kind of the book? Or are you just sort of not even necessarily thinking multiple steps down the road? I, I, I am. I, I have considered it. My, you know, with with Bell States, it has been such a, a like a, a pleasure to write and get feedback and feel that sort of creative. I feel like it has improved me as a uh, my my writing ability just because it was such a long process. But I, and so let me answer these questions systematically or I'm going to get lost. So what am I doing with it right now? Yes, I got feedback. I have feedback from you and uh, from Rebecca and from a few other people. I have taken that feedback and you and I still, I still have some things I want to talk about with you, but you know, we got a good third of the way through your notes um, before we ran out of time last week. And so essentially I've taken, I've aggregated all the notes and I have kind of gone through it um, like kind of quickly and said, these are the things that I think are the highest priority. These are the things that I want to like reanalyze in the context of what I wrote and see, do, do I still agree with this? Because there are certain mistakes that like, as soon as you pointed them out, I was like, yeah, this is a functional thing that I do. I need to go and fix this. Um, or like, you know, story ideas where Rebecca noticed something that maybe didn't feel right. It's like, all right, I'm definitely going to change that. So I'm kind of, I'm going through and, and I'm making those changes and, and I'm, I've made it, um, you know, not far cause it is kind of slow going to, to do this, but I think I'm about, I don't know, 20% of the way through, um, you know, actually going through and making those edits and I'm really excited about some of them. I mean, I've made a few that I actually, I want to send you just like the snippets to see what you think, because I added some things that I think, um, they add a kind of a, a bit of a new dimension to some of the characters. They make some parts of it creepier. Uh, so I, I am excited about those things. So it's kind of, it has reinvigorated me. I, I have set a soft goal for, um, the end of the month. And I don't know if, how realistic that is based on the, my, progress but at the end of the month i would like to have i would like to have done a first pass with all of these notes and then i think the next thing to do would be to have me sit down and without any editing like you know i'm locked out of editing read it just you know just do a read through and once that's done i have a handful of of i guess second round readers um you know i guess those would be the beta readers that i want to send it to but I'm not going to wait for their feedback to try to submit it. I mean, you know, the route that I think is the, the the route that, you know, I guess is the norm is that I'm going to find, or I have found literary agents that align with my type of content and I'm going to follow their submission guidelines. And, you know, a lot of them are, you submit, you know, sort of a, a short outline of your story and then the first 10 pages and you send it to them and, you know, and hope for the best. So. That is that. That's my next step, which I, I'd like to be at least moving on by summertime. 
And then the, the agents leverage their connections with publishers to try to say, okay, I like this book. I think we have a home for it. And they would then be, you know, effectively become your literary agent. I mean, that's the idea. You look, you'd be looking to sign with a literary agent who would obviously take this book to market, but then be yours ongoing. Is that sort of how it works in the yeah, novel assu- field? Yeah, assuming, yeah, assuming that they, you know, they believe in you, which I imagine, you know, it, I don't know exactly how, you know, how it works beyond that, honestly, because it's just, uh, I think it's one of those things like once you get to that point, you don't really talk about it quite as much, you know, mm-hmm. it's like a little bit, you know, playing the cards close to the chest. So we'll see. I, I will vow that if I, if I get that far, I will disclose all the secrets. <laughs> no, that's cool. Well, you know, you're right. And that's something interesting. Even just that you said in passing is, is a big part of why, I am in as chatty as I am with how the business works is because when you get, it's like each level of success you get, you talk about it less and less. And part of it I think is not ego. There's a, there's an aspect where it's like we try to talk about what we're doing while we're trying to achieve success. And then once we feel like we've crossed over and made it, it's like less cool to talk about it. You want to play it cool. You don't want to sound like you're kind of, you know, talking up your own hype. So you talk less. And yet, and and so the rest of us who are sort of observing our respective industries, whether it's film or writing, it's like all this institutional knowledge, then it just, it, you pass behind this wall that you only have access to once you're inside it. And I feel like, we should be a lot more outspoken with demystifying how things are going. And, 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 uh, you know, it's a big reason I was really, I really appreciated. We talked about this before Darius Martyr, you know, writer, director of sound of metal. He was really outspoken on the award circuit. You know, he was up for best picture and, um, and he was talking a lot about how hard it was to get that film made. And, and he's like, it's important that we sort of talk about the fact that I lost funding, you know, a week before shooting, <laughs> was able to get it through. Cause he's like, he's like, just so we don't all don't go crazy as filmmakers thinking that is it, is it, is it, is it only this is it hard me? for me? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but it is something that I even notice, like when I talk about agents, like I naturally find myself going out of my way, not to say my agent because I feel so slimy Like I'm a douchebag dropping, yo, my agent put me up for this or this or that. Like I'm so Mm -hmm. conscious of sounding like that. I'll go out of my way not to talk about it or not to mention that I have an agent. And all that's doing is just adding more mystique and and just mystery and unclarity to the process when, when the reality is it's like, you know, well, here's how, like, you know, talking about the John Woo thing, here's how that happened. My agent repped him and thought I'd be good for it and put me up for it. And, I mean, but uh, maybe, maybe it's one of those things, like, just talking about it is that that's how you demystify it. And it, yeah. it, so it becomes less, uh, I mean, what, what's the opposite of taboo? Like, when something is, like, exciting and titillating, like, you know, that lots of people have agents and this is just how it works. And, like, we think of an agent like, oh, the people who have agents are, like, A-list actors and – you know, a list sport like athletes, right? But you know, there are people who need agents all up and down the line, like to represent them, and whether they're big, you know, big name, small name, behind the scenes, like you know, they are the for better or worse, kind of like the grease in the system that kind of connects things and keeps things moving. It is such a benchmark to get an agent because of what we think they represent to us in a career, and it's true. It is a benchmark. It's a goal, and and I just remember. You know, when I would consume all of the stories, the breaking in stories of all of the filmmakers that I respected, so many of them would just be like, you know, they would just be recounting all of the trials of their, you know, trying to make it. And then they'd say, you know, and then I got an agent and they would move on. And it was just like, wait, you all just sort of gloss over. And then I got an agent as if that's an easy thing, because for me, it was like you graduate film school and you try to get an agent. And after, you know, 10 years of that not happening, it's just sort of like, I just sort of like gave up and just sort of whatever, it's going to happen when it's going to happen. And then it finally happened for me in a way and in a path in a minute that I was not expecting. But then it's like, yeah, cool. I got it. it that's still like your career isn't going to magically unfold. There is still so much more work you have to do. And largely you are still doing it yourself. I mean, a great filmmaker, working writer, director that we both know 
who's repped by CAA, he still is like most of the jobs I get, I kind of get for myself or they're just through, you know, relationship. It's not like he's not at the level where people are coming to him and his agents are like, you know, just batting down all the offers and they're negotiating all this stuff. It's still a hustle. It's still work. And your agents are there. They help you and, and they can do a lot for you. And it is true that it's hard to get to a certain level without one. But it's not but like. I mean, but at the end of the day, they also have relational capital that that they feel the need to somewhat protect. Um, protect it because Absolutely. like getting an agent feels like a a deep validation, right? You're like the industry has recognized my value, and that's why. And and you I, probably also once I have an agent, I'm going to be on easy street, right? Like they're gonna every idea I have, they're gonna tell me how great it is, and they're gonna get it greenlit, right? I mean, and I don't know if that's part of it, but. The idea that it is a, a validation from an industry that up to that point is consistently telling that telling you that we're not interested in you, yeah, and like you know tr- showing you the door. Um, and, but then when you actually get it, you realize, yes, it does represent that to a certain degree, but it like it has opened a door into a building filled with doors, <laughs> and so. <laughs> the the agent is really there to direct you towards the right doors but they can't they don't necessarily have the keys to all those doors and that's the, that's the realization that you have and it's largely still you saying i want to go to this floor and i want to open these doors can you turn oh, the yeah. knob for me yeah it's okay. it's it, it it's the relationship works a lot better when it's you're directing them here's what i want to be doing can you enable me to do that well um, see that's a good piece of you know information yeah I probably could help some people when they first get an agent and realize like I have to still do the hustle part. Now, the John Woo thing, which I'm still waiting about my agent prepped me. It could be a while before, you know, we sort of he- they hear they-, they decide on the on the on the writer for the project. So there's no update there. And that was something that kind of came out of the blue. Now, it was two days after I had written an email saying, hey, um, my wife's, you know, we might be dealing with this cancer journey for the next year. Uh, so I'm not really going to go be traveling, trying to make a film. I, I'd love if there's any just writing work I could do just as a writer, I'd be interested. And then two days later, he said, um, well, there's this John Woo project. But that that was a response of me saying, bring me any writing jobs that I might be good for, knowing that there's 50 other clients between the two of them my two agents that are more qualified, more experienced. I wasn't really even expecting anything. So the fact that he came back with this really felt like a gift. And I was like, you know, oh, that's him wanting to show he's there for me. He's, you know, in my corner. Or maybe, truthfully, he he saw something in me in this project that he really thought, you know what, Thomas would be really good. I I kind of believe that. But, you know, I, I'm assuming he's doing that with a handful of other clients. So there's an aspect where he's just like, well, I want to get one of my clients on this job because obviously Mm -hmm. then he, you know, he's got a financial incentive for it, but also he's committed to helping. But, but every time I, I ask if I give them a very pointed thing, like I, I'm, I wrote a uh, limited series treatment, um, kind of a pitch deck and a treatment for a limited series. And I wanted to get it to Tim Van Patten who's sort of a legend. He's, you know, writer, director on Boardwalk Empire. Didn't create it. That was Terrence Winter, but Tim and Patton's a legend in the kind of the limited series space. He got it to him and that resulted in an hour conversation with Tim. It was just a a highlight. Tim was an an incredible guy. He didn't sort of sign on to the project, but he read it. He appreciated it. And we had a back and forth about it. Then, and then I was like, oh, I want to get to Vince Gilligan because, you know, Vince Gilligan, obviously creator of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. He also was a big Al Capone buff in my stories in, set in the Al Capone world. Got it to Vince Gilligan and uh, actually got a really amazing response back from Vince via, you know, email. But it was it was clear they read it. They were very thoughtfully read it and they had a really thoughtful response and even opened the door for like maybe some sort of tangential involvement down the road. But it was like that's what my that's what the agents do. I say, can you get this to Vince? They get it to Vince, and Vince's team takes it seriously because you know ICM is bringing it to them. Now Vince right. happens to be an ICM client, so I knew it was it was within the door. But Tim Van Patten's at CAA, so it's like you, if you don't have an agent, 
you're not really even getting read because they can't, they don't have time for all of the good projects that agents are bringing them. So anyone who's unsolicited, unrepresented, is not even really getting considered. But the agent gets you, what do you want to do? Let me bring it there. And then the other side then takes it seriously. They absorb it. They read it. Uh, so you kind of have that advocate. You have an agent. <laughs> you have someone with agency who can sort of do that. And obviously, as you grow in your career and you become someone with a resume or someone with accolades, then they start coming to you and your agent then starts to field the offers and help you uh you know negotiate those things but they're but they're largely you know and even my agent sort of there was two of them you know i sort of two and they're both partners in in the firm so they're high up and one was like you know i'd love to work for you and the other one was like with you it was sort of funny they even in the room they have different they were just different sort of philosophies like, you know, and he was like yeah with you for you but it was positioning yourself of like hey i'm working for you and a lot of a lot of people on the, my side of it would be like, remember, your agent works for you. You know, that's why you can fire them, hire them. And I, and I actually, I do see it more of a, as a partnership. I was like, yeah. I, because we, we are trying to make each other money. I mean, that, that is, that is the definition of a partnership. They are trying to further my career and make me money, negotiate better rates so they can make their own money. So they, their income is tied to my income. So it is a partnership. And I actually, I don't see it as binary as, oh, you work for me. Um, obviously, if there's a point where it's like we're not aligned on what we want to do, then you know you can let them go and move on. But I'm also like figuring out the dynamic of communicating with them. You know, like I, I, I was following up on this Vince Gilligan thing because I just wanted to make sure they got the email. Like there was no response, and they're actually they're usually very responsive. Send an email within you know 12 hours. There's some sort of reply acknowledgement, and there wasn't for this particular thing. So a couple of days later, I followed up and I kind of got scolded like, hey, it's not a quick process pitching to Vince. It's going to take a while. And I was like, no, 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 that's fine. I just wanted to make sure you got the email. And and I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm still figuring out the dynamics of how we communicate with these very powerful, high profile agents and me very conscious that I'm like an up and comer. And, uh, so there's, how, how there, much, there, there's, how much of this, these sort of experiences do you like, do, do you note, notate how, how much of this kind of stuff do you keep track of? I, I mean, and I'm curious because uh, assuming that I keep we track of it, all of the, the benchmarks. Well, like that little, that little anecdote that you just had, is that something that you have captured somewhere other than this podcast? I, now? I keep, I keep a diary and, um, does it, have, Hey, does it have a lock on it? <laughs> It sits on my, it's on my iPhone, my notepad, my note. Well, it's, oh, and, 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 you know, there's inevitably something to write within a given week. It's usually like a pro, like a career diary. So anytime there's something to note, like, Hey, minor premise released, uh, you know, Hey, uh, you know, got an agent. Hey, had this amazing zoom with John Woo and, uh, oh, Hey, and, and, and I do recall writing down that little anecdote, something like still figuring out the dynamics of how to even talk to my agents, like that little thing. Like I, I probably wrote it as a phrase. I, I think I, I, I feel like, you know, and this is just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm giving you homework, but I feel like those are the kind of things that you should flesh those out and give more detail. Because mm. if we, if we are in the, uh, uh, the, you, the, the version of reality where you like become super successful People are going to ask you the question, these kind of questions, and it, you know, you will have vague memories of like, yeah, or maybe you won't have a memory of it at all because yeah. life will have just kind of swept it away. But then, just remembering that, like, it was, yeah, I guess I didn't know how to talk to an agent because, like, what you're saying, you and I have different communication styles. So, like, I think in if if that had been me, I would have sent that email and then, like, you know, just forgotten about it. Assuming they respond in the same sort of time frame that I do, which is you know, one to six weeks. Right. Um, <laughs> Well, I was basing it on their on their pattern of very quick acknowledgments. Like, okay, yeah. got it. Now, I asked them to do, you know, over the last year and a half, I've asked them to do a whole handful of things, and they've acknowledged every one. They haven't fully done every one. Like a couple of them, it. I just sort of let it go. I was just like, yeah, I just, you know, they they said they would do it. Maybe they tried. It just didn't really pan out. So I've I've I'm not harping on everything, but that particular one, I did. I was like. And it's the stupid thing we play, you know, when we're in dating relationships. It's just like, did did they get the email? Did they even – you start to play it in your mind. It's like they usually reply really quickly and now it's several days later. But let me go through the junior agent who's sort of on the team and just text them, hey, 
I just double checking they got the email. And so I asked this junior agent and it's like, oh, let me ask. And then I got an email from my main agent later, kind of like, kind of scolding me. And, and, and I was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't, you know, and because he thought like I was, I was trying to rush the process with this junior agent who then went to him. And I was just like, and, and it was just sort of a misunderstanding of it. I was just like, totally don't, don't want to rush the process. I just wanted to make sure you got the email and, you know, I know we're all busy. And so I didn't want to ask him directly. I went to the junior agent thinking he'd be like, no, 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 we got it. Like, yeah, he's on it rather than him checking on it. Cause it was sort of like, yeah. Hey Thomas, I'm on it. And that's the thing I got to learn. Like every time I ask him something, I just got to be like, they're on it and just let the process happen. And, 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 and I even, I even mentioned that in the email. I said, appreciate the grace as I still figure out the relational dynamics here. <laughs> well, and it's hard because like you are, there is an expectation that you will continue to hustle and do work. And you know, the, the, the alternative mistake is that they didn't get it. And then you just assume that they did. And then you never hear anything and you just sort of let it die. Right. And then later they're like, Oh, why didn't you remind me? Yeah. You know, which that's not fair either. But so it, that well, is, and he hard, said that he's like, you, you can know, always call me. He, and he's always saying that you can always call me. And I'm like, and he's old school agent. I mean, he reps like these legacy directors, like Brian De Palma, Peter Weir, Woody Allen. And I'm like, that's an old like i'm not gonna call you how what an inefficient <laughs> thing to do is like dial a number and call <laughs> well but there I, I know that it's weird but this is something that i've certainly learned recently in my career is that if you are working with somebody from that era call yeah because true. that like i mean you know i've been play their uh, game yeah just because it like it means something to them you know and, and this is like such a you know dale carnegie sort of thing but there are people who are sort of from an older generation that I, that I work with. And when I do things like remember their kids names or their, you know, a partner's name, and then like, I'm their favorite person in the world because I just like that little thing. Mm. But like, you know, with people our age, I feel like they, you know, may, probably wouldn't even remember that. I remember that kind of thing. Like it's just not important, but um, anyway, so yeah, the, the idea of the, like, withholding and expending relational capital i think is probably is kind of a big part of it because you know and we've seen it before where it's like especially early in the btp days we would ask people for like oh could you do this could you help us could you connect us with this person and there was you know and i won't name any of our early patrons you know who were hesitant but you know they were like i could in retrospect now see their hesitance was because they realized like i only have so much you know relational capital to expend and like do i want to give it away on a project that i am not really sure about we had a great conversation with chad harbold who we know was our one of our producers on minor premise and who's on the fantastic guy who's on the producing team for all the names we buried and he's repped by craig castell at wme which is a big agent yeah, at a, a big, big agency and uh but he's still like hustling for all his projects and he's always he always inevitably has this conversation early in relationships with other people almost preemptively like don't ask me to leverage my wme connections because i need to reserve that for me like he's he's very aware of where he sits on the wme sort of you know board of clients and he needs to save all of that relational capital for himself and his own projects he can't be trying to like pitch you know and i never asked him to do that um and i but i really appreciated him saying that because it just it, and that was even before i was rep by I, icm i was just aware of like you just getting signed to like craig castell and wme isn't gonna like ensure your career he still has to work and leverage that relationship for himself and he can't then extend that relational capital to other people and and i'm in you know a year and a half with icm i'm a very aware of that. Like I still, you know, I have very attentive agents. They're very responsive. Uh, and they're, but there's also a limit of what they can do. They can't just make my career happen. It's like, I've got to, each new project is an opportunity to obviously open up the doors to more and more before it kind of converts over and you start getting offers. I mean, that's sort of the goal. And it's like, until that happens, it's really hard for, you know, for them to just sort of make things happen for you. So it's still a hustle. It's still work. And, um, you know, it's, uh, and not that I've had people asking, Hey, can you like help me get my project to ICM? But 
it's I, I just really appreciated it because it's just it's like the journeyman, you know, working kind of, <laughs> you know, blue collar aspect of the business. And it's certainly I mean, talk about, you know, we're all eking by just trying to like live. Yeah. And uh, a couple updates with me since last episode. I tease that there was more good news coming with all the names we buried. We didn't get the Sun Valley Producers Grant, but we did get something that has just been announced which is pretty exciting. Um, the film has been selected into the Frontiers platform at the Cannes Film Market. So the Cannes Film Market is probably the biggest film market in the world. It happens every year. It's certainly tied to the Cannes Film Festival. They are separate entities. They're they're connected in, in I think, you know, governing body and organization, but they are two different events. You know, the festival screens films and awards films the market is for buying and selling finished products near finished products and products in development um i don't i've never been to the can market and i don't know if it's just an open sort of trade show where anyone can sort of buy a booth and sell their film but the frontiers platform is a very particular part of the market which is sponsored in part with the market and fantasia film festival um where they're they're looking for projects in development and uh to qualify to get access to have your film part of the platform it has to be in development has to have at least 20% funding and it has to have a proof of concept video and we checked all those boxes you know we hadn't made the film yet we had at least 20% and we made this you know teaser trailer back in 2019 which in another episode, we should talk about making teasers for films because I've learned a lot in the in the it and, was and pitch decks. I feel like that is also oh, something pitch that you decks, could absolutely that you could uh, and, and enlighten people on. The, one of the best things we did for our film was making this teaser and the fact that it just turned out really good <laughs> because we submitted and uh, we got notice from the Frontiers platform. Hey, we're going to include your project in our platform at the Can Market. And it was only after I got accepted that I then looked into it and realized it's a big deal. It's a big deal. They only accept up to 10 films. I don't know how many are applying, but I'm assuming it's at least hundreds because yeah. it's the Can Market and the Frontiers platform has been going for s- several years. And basically buyers, financiers, sales agents, they attend the Frontiers platform knowing they're going to be shown 10 proof of concepts for projects that, you know, are up their alley. And then based on that, they say, okay, I want to learn more about that, you know, this film. And then they schedule one-on-one meetings and you try to raise your your f- funding. And I know several filmmakers, Chad, uh, no, you know, has a contact and Noah has a contact that basically got their films funded through this platform. So it's track rate for, for connecting you with hungry, thirsty buyers is really great. There's no guarantees. Well, yeah. I mean that, cause that, that, that's what makes it, you know, cool. You have people who are going there because they want to spend money. Yes. They, they're look, they're looking on it for an investment. And not um, only, and, so and it's a captive audience. They only accepted seven. It's like they, they max it at 10, but they only accepted seven and only two from the U.S. And all the names. Oh, so it's, from, not even, it's not even the top 10. It's just the whatever it, they think is worth yeah, putting I'm in curious, there. Yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious. You know, I can't imagine seven films. I mean, because and, and I've seen a couple of the other proof of concepts and they're good. It's like these are these are films that are, you know, that they're not just – accepting anything that hits these qualifications. They want something that they feel like is a strong project that represents their brand. You know, the Frontiers, yeah. Fantasia Frontiers plant platform, these genre films. And, and and some of them can tend to be horror or very high genre. All the names we buried as a thriller, a dramatic thriller is actually, it, it's less of a quote unquote genre film than the others. And I'm I'm curious if that'll help us or hurt us. You know, if, if buyers are there like, no, 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 we want a, you know, bloody horror film that we know will sell. Your film looks good, but it's just, it's, it's more risky prospect because we don't, we don't know how the market will re- react to it, which would be a valid concern. Um, but, um, and so two American films. So basically I got to create a pitch video up to eight minutes, you know, two of which is, is the proof of concept. And then me sort of talking and then July 10th, 
the pitch video, you know, these seven films will be shown to all the attendants of the Frontiers platform at the Can Market. And then I guess that following that weekend or the following week, you know, hopefully I'll fill my schedule with one on one follow up meetings with potential financiers. And hopefully we'll get the film financed. Now, you know, a couple episodes I talked about pivoting back to a smaller version of the film because the path to make the close to $1 million version of the film, that path, you know, was no longer there. So I had to pivot to where the, there was a path. This is an opportunity now. There's a path to making the bigger version of the film because I think, you know, to do the film right is to do that bigger version. It gives us more time. It, it helps us to not have, you know, ask people to do, to, to do deferments. We get our post-production already raised. And uh, so it's a better version of the film. But now there's actually a path because, you know, that's a budget that would that these financiers would expect. And we'll find out yeah, in July. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, obviously, this isn't news to me, but, you know, congr- congratulations for the for the sake of the podcast. I'll say it for all of us that are listening. You know, it's definitely a benchmark moment. And, you know, it's hard. People are like, oh, congratulations, you got into Cannes. I was like, no, 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 I, the film didn't get into Cannes. That's, that's a different thing. It's like, we are part of the Cannes market. And, uh, you know, it's, or someone's like, oh, you got your film fun today. I was like, no, 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 access to financiers. You know, so I'm, so, I'm, I'm always kind of having to explain to people what's happening. But it's like, they're like, shut up. It's a win. Come on. You get it. I was like, you're right. It's a win. It's great. But um, no, but I, it is a win 100%. But I also agree with your sentiment of like, but let's just, let's hedge our excitement yeah. a bit. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, let's uh, not, not, let's not be the old versions of ourselves where everything is like, all right, well, all done, it's, you know. To the analogy of the roller coaster, which is all this career is, all this, you know, attempt of a career is. It's like the only way to 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 ma- to actually sustain that is to just you know is to hedge excitement is to temper expectations to be sober, and in some ways, I mean, the hard part, the painful, the damaging part is that you stop hoping for things. You you start losing hope because when you hope for something too much and it doesn't happen, you get heartbroken, and so figuring out how to hope, but without sort of the expectation or hope. Like I can hope for the John Woo thing. I feel like if I don't get it, I'll be okay because I've developed some emotional health around it. Uh, you know, a whole different discussion of this sort of thing, but you know, these, the, these are sort of things that I'm, that I'm actively intentionally investing time into figuring out to weather, to, to weather the storm, to actually sustain the roller coaster because, you know, it is it is way too volatile, and so something like this, it's a big win, and hopefully it allows us to raise our f- finance to be to film the film in May or to film the film in September. But it could not, and you know I'm sort of also preparing for that as well. Um, but that's cool. That's new news since our last episode. No, that is, that's exciting. I, but w- about you know what you're saying about hope. Um, this sounds dark and, you know, I've expressed before that I'm not a religious person. I'm not Buddhist, but I do like, you know, kind of the way that Buddhists deal with hope and the fact that hope when it is, uh, because hope is such a broad thing when it is misused. I don't know if that's the right way of saying that, um, that hope can be super destructive, right? Like when hope is based in desire and, um, that, you know, that, that hope can be very destructive. And so it's, sometimes it is better, you know, you really have to balance that. Bringing up the Buddhist idea of hope. I've been, um, doing some research for a project and have been reading, uh, Analects by Confucius for this project. And it's just, it's really rich, ancient, sacred texts for a Buddhist, Buddha's contemporary. I think they were similar time and obviously, you know, Chinese sort of religion and philosophy, there was something that Confucius said in one of his, you know, one of the verses of Analects that I, it brought me so much peace as someone who's, you know, late thirties, about to be 40, that is fully consumed with sort of like, you know, my place in life and career. And he said, at 15, I set my heart on learning. At 30, I took my stand. At 40, I came to be free from doubts. At 50, I understood the decree of heaven. At 60, my ear was attuned. At 70, I followed my heart's desire without overstepping the line. And I'm like, if Confucius is still figuring out how to like, 
you know, at 70, it's like, you know, he's tracking the benchmarks of wisdom and there's still things to learn at 70. I was like, man, I got time. I got, I'm so, I'm not even 40. I'm not even in the third sort of thing. I just think it's a great reminder that hopefully we're all work, we're all learning and growing and gaining wisdom. And it's not like, oh, by 40, if I haven't figured it out, I haven't hit my career. I mean, that's where the midlife crisis comes because we think we, we play into this societal productivity kind of demands that we have to be doing a certain thing, reaching a level of career. When the reality is the last half of our life, and Richard Rohr, who's a Catholic monk, uh, writes a lot about basically the first half of your life is just to figure out the shape of your container, you know, your internal container. It's not until the second half of your life that you're really going to start filling that container. And it's just, it, it, for, for people like me who are ambitious and who are, who have achieved a certain amount of success in the first half of their life, it's a, such a good reminder to just remember, like, like I'm not even midlife yet. You know what yeah. I mean? I mean, <laughs> if you, if you get to a point where you feel like you don't have things to learn, then you've made a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with the Buddhist thing, it, I think, they use hope and sort of desire some not maybe not interchangeably but it's like when you when hope becomes desire then that's when it becomes problematic mm. right like i am expecting this yeah. to happen yeah and that's when disappointment comes yeah and, and and i guess that is the it's a it's a fine line between you know like it would be it would be enjoyable if this thing happened as yep. opposed to i expect that it will happen so anyway i think that's a good you know I, I am uh, validating your sort of the way that you were talking about hedging the excitement because yeah. yes, it would be very nice if this happened. I don't have an expectation that I will like, I, I, there's no reason I don't deserve it. I haven't, you know, earned it. Like I don't yep. expect it, but I will be very happy if it happens. Yep. And I think that you know, anytime I can do that with something in my life, it always is better whether I get it or not. Mm-hmm. Coming up, I ask Justin about my backyard home project, and he takes the question in a totally different direction. Hey, it's episode 10. Did we mention it's episode 10? That's Big Ten Energy. Stay with us. Last week, I broke my laptop accidentally. I uh, pinched my headphone jack in it as I was closing it, and it just broke the screen. And Apple Care came to the rescue, but I had to send it away for a few days. I was actually in the middle of an edit for a gig. <laughs> and it was nice for a few days because I was like, I had no laptop, and I was just like free. And I was like, oh, you know, people asking me to do different random things. And I was like, oh, I can't. My laptop's away for repair and it was just a nice uh, you know i wasn't fully unplugged i had an ipad and high iphone so i could do things i wanted to do but i couldn't do a lot of the other stuff it was actually really nice and then i actually thought the, the i thought it was going to come back much sooner than it did so i was telling him oh i'll be on track to deliver the edit at the end of the week and then when that wasn't the case it was like can we push the deadline they're like no you might need to rent a laptop <laughs> Which I was like, oh yes, of course. This is this is my issue. This, my this isn't yours. This is my responsibility. So um, thankfully, I borrowed a laptop, and then mine came right away. So I was able to finish my commitment for the edit and deliver it on time. But what was nice of not having kind of the burden of the work device, and if it was there, even if I wasn't doing an edit, I would fill the day with other stuff to do. I kind of had some time, and I and I got some home projects done. And uh, I, I had the impulse like last weekend to redesign my fire pit in my backyard, which largely was just a circle of bricks that we've had for years. And I was like, I, I, I can make this cool. I'm trying to remember what was the initial impulse to just sort of redesign. But um, it was like, I'm not just going to redesign the fire pit. And I looked up some cool inspiration and I kind of got vision for it. But then I was like, oh, let's, let's get some string lights, maybe build a little, I got these pallets that can turn those into, you know, sort of patio furniture. So I started this creative project and, and, uh, it was just a lot of fun and it was really fulfilling and it sort of, it, 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 it occurred to me of just my own propensity to need creative projects. But I'm also curious, 
like, and if you can relate to this, like if, if, if we're feeling like so a creative, you know, a purpose depression, like, oh, we're, we're bet- between projects, we need something to fill our mind. For me, a lot of that can get satiated with a space design, like whether it's my office or my house, like it really is a fulfilling creative exercise because it's like you get vision. Like I got vision. Oh, I want to make the fire pit like this. I want to do lights like this. Then I went to Lowe's. It was like I bought stuff. So it was, it was then I was actually building it. It was hard work. So I was like exercising. It was just so fulfilling. And I was wondering, it's like, you kind of wonder, oh, could this, could you, what if this was your job? And then maybe it would be a whole different sort of burden if it was your job, but it was really fun. And I'm not quite done. I'm probably 80% done. I'm still kind of picking a, picking at it, but I'm wondering, like, do you, are you this a similar way? Is it is it a function of being creatives where we always need a project to be doing? And like there were years where I wouldn't do anything with my office or my house. And that was probably because all of that creative energy was focused on making a film or a script or whatever. And this particular week, I kind of had nothing. And I can't just sit and relax and chill. Maybe I could have had a good book to read. I was like, oh, I just want to, I got to, you know, redesign my fire pit in the whole backyard area. Is it because we're creatives and we, we thrive off of projects or is there something about our dwelling, our space that everybody can sort of relate to? You know, is it that we our house is the one thing we can kind of control. So we like to design it and we always, cause I grew up always rearranging my room and every couple of years I'd get a burst of creative motivation. I'd rearrange my room. Are you the same way? Is this something about being a homeowner or is this something about being a creative? Uh, so I honestly think that it is societal and I don't, I haven't done the research to know if this is how universal this is, but I think that as a society, we have an addiction to productivity. <laughs> Agreed. And I, I you know, I, I know that you, you know, you, you have, um, you know, what do you call them? Clients that, you know, people hire you to, to do a job, yes. but that's not quite the same as having a boss. Um, and, you know, I have a boss, I have, you know, deliverables, like all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, a lot of people do. And, my boss is great. He's like, he's actually super hands off. He lets, he just, he trusts me, right? He hired me because he trusts me and he believes in me. So he's not always like checking in on me. Um, but if I, sometimes I will have these days where I get all my work done and I have to send it to somebody and essentially like, I don't have really much to do until, you know, until I get some feedback or whatever. And I'll just have these like lulls and I will feel guilty about not doing work. And it, and that extends into like my free time of like um, the voice that's saying like, why are you wasting your time? And uh, I know I sort of invoke my my therapist quite a bit, but he, I think he's the one who really made me realize that, that like there is nothing pathological about relaxation. Now, I don't think that means that what you're doing, you know, what you just described is pathological because I also like to do those things. Um, but I think part of the thing that makes it uh, – the motivation and maybe the joy is that like we feel we, we we have this very high internal valuation of productivity and you know i can tell the difference between like uh rebecca bought a uh, this really cool old dresser for our son off craigslist recently and you know in true craigslist fashion it's a coin toss how the thing is especially during covid you can't really inspect it they just like bring it to you, you Venmo the money. And then I'm inspecting it in the garage and it's like, it's very beautiful and also like busted as hell inside. And so I had to like rebuild the drawers. And so, you know, I'm like, like trying not to hyperventilate thinking about this project that I have to do. And then I get into it and I'm like, I start hand cutting dovetails and, you know, doing like cutting grooves so I can slide the thing in. And I was like, well, while I'm in here, why don't I do some improvements? Like, why don't I put uh, a drawer stop so that he doesn't pull it like the drawer doesn't come all the way out because it's one of those old dressers right where it's easy to just you just keep pulling and the thing falls <laughs> out on you and so i'm like i bet i could design a drawer stop for this pretty easily and so i did and then you know it was it felt good i think to what you're talking about i was like being creative and I, like it was tangible 
right? I'm creative at work every day. I come up with creative solutions for data analysis and stuff. But at the end of the day, I like zip the file and send it. And it's like, well, that was a little bit of a <laughs> letdown at the end of the day. But like, you know, our friend John Davey back in the day when he used to build custom doors and he's like, you know, such a, a love, loving, lovely, like huggy sort of uh, guy from central Pennsylvania. But he's also like a real man's man <laughs> in that like he would go to work and like be sawing boards every day. And I was like, what would it be like to have something, your work be so di discreetly tangible, like a farmer? Yes. And maybe that's a little bit of like – uh, blue collar f fetish, yeah. uh, fetishization, fet fetishizing. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, because I, do, I don't have to do that sort of labor all the time. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's a combination between our, uh, the ingrained need to be productive. I mean, think about it, like you've got kids that range in ages. It starts with homework. Like, why do we send our kids to school for eight hours a day? And then they come home and they have more work to do. We're teaching them that like you go to work, yeah. but then when you go home, you still need to work. Like your work time <laughs> is not over, which is like – and then my kids do virtual school and they – you know, uh, asynchronous. They can finish it in two hours. And I'm like, so wait, why are they in school for eight hours and then still have two hours of homework to do? Because <laughs> we're preparing them for a world where we are expected to continue to work after the end of the business day. So I, I relate to a lot of what you're saying. Um the the addiction to productivity, and this is something that I really had my eyes open to when I worked in the senior living industry. So for three years, I was doing video production for a company that owned and operated a chain of retirement communities. And it was a very progressively minded company, very pro-aging. And so my eyes were open to ageism that's rampant in our culture and in our media. And a lot of people who are sort of part of this culture change sort of movement um, talk about the kind of cult of productivity in sort of the West and, and America, because for those of us who are working to serve and, you know, to create a product for retirees, people in their senior living age, a big consistent crisis for these largely men who uh, were in, you know, the workforce all through, you know, these these are men in their 70s. Uh, yeah, so so like, it was largely I mean, them working. And then they retire. They have a crisis of identity because their identity – Because those guys, like the greatest generation, the silent generation, that was like you just put your head down yeah. and you work and you just do it. And so what happens when you retire – and we are really bad in the West and in America of honoring retirees. We, 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 we really discard them. We relegate mm -hmm. them to either you know nursing homes versus the East, Asian culture, which honored its elders and, and the old people. I mean I just read that quote from Confucius talking about finally at 70 I learn moderation essentially, but also you know the, the – the fathers and mothers, your grandparents, they're they're honored in a way that they're not in in the Western culture. And a lot of that has to do with I, I think what you're talking about is this addiction to productivity. And I even wrote this TV special about it when I worked at INSP about – it's called Old Henry. It's about an old man dealing with the challenges of agent, aging and he's sort of trying to – you know, and we cast Ralph Waite, the great Ralph, Ralph Waite who is you know, John Walton from the Waltons and – has now passed away, and it was a real thrill to be able to work with him. He was in his 80s when we filmed, and uh, one of the lines, you know, he's talking to his son who's, you know, 60 but still a white-collar businessman. He's like, we're not the title on our business card, and when you no longer have that title, are you going to know who you are? And it mm -hmm. was all this rich idea that I got because I my job was interviewing these men and women in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, getting their life story on tape. It was a real amazing job recording these. It was a life story sort of documentary series. It was a keepsake. It, it was it was a it was like a 90 minute conversation that I'd film and I'd give back to the family so they'd have kind mm -hmm. of an heirloom, capturing these stories. But it was a consistent sort of pressure. And so a company like the company I worked for was like, aging is an achievement. We, we, we celebrate aging. And now that you're out of work, you know, you can, you know, we, we honor you and you can, you know, have that sort of, have a good quality of life. Um, but it is a pervasive addiction or, you know, problem that we are a productivity uh, oriented culture. And it was interesting because first you said, 
you 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 struggle with this guilt and i was like oh, i don't necessarily relate to guilt of not working for me i'm motivated by a desire to create but then i'm even thinking that could also be a productivity addiction that I've developed in this culture in the same way, you know, where kids can develop these dopamine addictions to social media and mm -hmm. this constant stimulus, reward, stimulus, reward in a culture like this, I could, someone like me, I could easily develop those same addictions with productivity, creation, reward, productivity, creation, reward. So that when I've got a couple of days without a laptop, I'm, I don't feel guilty. Oh, I should be doing something. I'm like, no, no, no. I want to feed the beast, feed the beast. But that 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 could also just be the addictive nature of the culture we're in versus, and this is something I'm actively trying to do more, stillness, contemplation, meditation, withdrawal. Yeah. Of just I think like, that's no, no, why no. meditation your, is so hard for yeah. us. Take your two days. Don't redesign your cool fire pit. Just be in the woods. And breathe in nature, you know what I mean? And and I'm actually I'm actively trying to do more contemplative exercise and practice. And it's it's I think you put your your finger on it. It's it's at odds with the addiction to productivity in our culture. I do I do feel like maybe I, I took a shit a little bit on your uh, on your project. <laughs> oh no no I didn't I didn't I didn't feel that at all. <laughs> I didn't feel that at all. Uh, yeah, you know. So yesterday, uh, my kids were. So they, they've gone back to in-person school, but they do asynchronous once a week. And yesterday was their asynchronous day. So they were home and it was just me. And so I was with the kids. We did schoolwork and I had been traveling. So I took the day off and for, for my, my work work. Uh, but I also had, you know, things that I wanted to get done. I wanted to edit the book. I had, th you know, and then also, and this is like the terrible thing, even though I took the day off, I knew there were things that during my quote day off, I was going to catch up on. Like, let me get back to these emails that are overdue during my day off. Cause then it like doesn't count or whatever. Um, so anyway, I had a lot of things that I wanted to do and, uh, but my, it was beautiful outside and my daughter was like in a bad mood and she wouldn't go like outside and play with her friends. And she just wanted to like lay around and I get that, but I also wanted her to like, get, you know, get some vitamin D, like get in the sun, be like, enjoy these nice days. We're going to have a bunch of thunderstorms and just go enjoy it. Um, and so I was like, all right, let me, let me try something and see if it works. And so, um, I, I made her some tea. I made tea and she and I, I, I had her come down and we drank tea and I gave her uh, this, this was the carrot, right? The incentive, the tea and, and some cookie dough. And so I set it up and she came downstairs and then I started asking her about this book series that she was reading. She's reading this book series called, I think, Wings of Fire. And it's like a, a whole, it was, Thomas is making a man, face. A man is reading that to uh, Rylan. Right okay. Now. Well, sh she's really into it. I and guess it's my new and popular. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of them, I, I guess, but yeah. um, my daughter also, she, yeah, it's about dragons and she crushes books. I mean, she's, you know, she's read the first three in, in the last week and I'm like, you need to slow down, like enjoy it a little bit. So uh, anyway, no, so she came out series, Gotta get through it all. <laughs> well, I mean, for her, it's like, she's got to consume that story. Um, she has very much rejected the cult of productivity at this point in her life. Um, so... And I started asking her about it. I was like, oh, tell me, uh, you know, because I've read it to her at bedtime a few times, but, you know, I will read it. And then she, like, the next time I read it, she'll be nine chapters further in the book. And I'm like, oh, so whatever happened with that scene where they were, like, locked in the cave? And she started telling me, and I'm like, well, who was the one that was under the water? And she was like, oh, that was Clay. I was like, oh, why did he do it? He's a mudwing. And I'm like, there's, like, so much lore in this book. And everything in my brain was telling me, like, that's enough now send her on her way, like tell her to go outside so you can get your work done. But then I kept saying, like, no, don't do it. Just like, keep asking her questions. Be like, Oh, well, so what tell me about this other one? What's a night wing. And it was, I mean, I don't know if you have this experience where like your kids are talking about Minecraft and stuff and you're like, I cannot hate, like if they spend another five minutes trying to like explaining this thing to me, I'm going to die. Um, and th there was a part of my brain that was very much saying that to me, but like, at a certain point, I was feeling that way enough that I was like, why don't we go skate and keep having this conversation? And then like I parlayed that into like, you know, an hour of skating outside with her literally just talking and talking and talking to me about this this world that she's fallen in love with. And for me, it was a med meditative exercise because I was doing something that added zero value to my productivity. But, I, you know, I, I think it helped. Yeah, there 
it was like a small drop in the larger ocean of she and I's relationship, but it was a positive drop. And, you know, she got to tell me about this. And now I feel I know enough that I can be like, so what did this character do this time? Or like, how are the dragonettes? Like, how's the prophecy turning out? And, um, but yeah, it was hard to like, just not do anything and just be there in this, you know, and it's funny because I want to say like valueless experience because I'm in the context of productivity in our society, like it has no lasting value, but it made her happy. And I, I it, we, we got to spend time together and she was really engaged with me in a way that she, you know, that is hard. She's not a teenager yet, but you know, she's getting close and it's hard to capture that with our kids as they get older. They just want to play with friends and play video games and with her read books. So, um, yeah, it's just interesting. That is an incredible story. Good, good dad good dad job justin and and well, it's so and, and i do want to point out it's not i'm not saying that because like you know he did do what i do i'm a great dad that was very much something i stumbled into and it just turned out really well but for you to frame the impulse to exercise patience deny the productivity deny even like a, a looming task to just invest some quality time into your daughter to frame that as meditation is such a a, a really that's a really profound thought and something is so true i just i had the exact same experience as you something within the last week i can't remember what it was but i remember my impulse was like shoo them away so i can get back to my thing when they just wanted to kind of hover and talk about this thing and i and i actively had to say no invest in them right now because the, the the pattern of shooing them away, then that that pattern just turns into your relationship. And then they're an adult. They're like, well, I, my relationship with my dad was like he never really had time for me. He was always sort of too busy. So I was like, no, that's not me. And that's not the relationship with my dad. My dad was very present and very engaged. And so oh, – But you know what? But, but, but it's hard oh, for us. To, yeah. I, don't, I mean I don't want to cut you off, but I do want to say it sucks because that is – like we have to work. Yeah. And like – and we are and, – and this is this thing I always struggled with when I used to have a like a nine-to-five that I actually went to work. I give the best hours, the most wakeful, conscious hours of my life to this job and I come yeah. home and I'm exhausted. Yeah. And, 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 oh, Amanda, and it, Amanda laments about that with Skylar who's – you know she's trying to like have this relationship with and it's like Skylar – it's like you give all your time to your friends at school and then you're tired and you know so it's like you know she's turning into a fight with it and, and, and that's uh, – its own sort of thing to navigate, but, but to then like to frame the impulse for those of, for, for us as dads who are battling this addiction to productivity or even the need to actually get something done within a work day to just investing in our kids, uh, you know, developing a conversation with them, asking them more of what they're talking about, framing that as meditation, as contemplation is really profound. And that's, it, it really rings true as, and the more we do that, I think the more we can actually exercise those things within our life, then those environments where we're faced with it again become more easy. It's less work. It's less of a, oh, I got I really want to be doing this other thing, but I'm going to like pretend to be really invested in you. And then by the time, then eventually you are because you've maybe severed some of those addictive sort of ties to the productivity or whatever. And so when then they're coming through, dad, check this out. You know, you can just keep asking. It's a topic you have no interest in or no knowledge of, but keep probing them. That's awesome, man. That's really – it's a good thing to sort of – I think uh, – I, when, I, when I prompted the whole thing about the backyard redesigning the fire pit, I, this just went in a completely different direction than I ever <laughs> thought it would go. And frankly, I was like, uh, who wants to talk about creativity again? Because it's a, it's a recurring topic. But for us to kind of go where it went, I think is so rich and so right and, and a good indication of, you know, our, our, our ability how our prompts to each other can, can uh, net different things because it's a really it's a really worthy thing i think for us to people in general to be aware of to work against. yeah and the one the one last thing i will say on it is that i think the biggest killer to it the thing that i could have done that would have that would have made it all worthless is multitask yeah good call if i had had my if i had had my phone to like just check and make sure that i wasn't missing anything or like let me like check and see how stop like that would ruin the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It was like I literally like I left my phone and and, and again it, it was just one of those things like I, I didn't do it because I said I'm let me be wise or anything like that. It's just I got caught up and I left it and then it was just because I didn't have like I remember reaching for it at one point because I felt that anxiety like I need to check in to make sure I'm not missing anything and I didn't have it. And I was like well right whatever we're skating yeah. so um, 
but yeah, that m- multitasking is like the death of of creativity and it, I relationship. Guess relationship also. <laughs> cool. Two picks coming in hot right now. Probably the two greatest picks we've ever done. You know what? Did the episode. So two two picks. My pick for this week, the thing that I'm going to recommend to people is uh and if you if you have them, call your grandparents. I I have started calling my grandfather recently, um, and he is you know he's obviously much older than me. We have maybe the most diametrically opposed political views that any two people can have. Um, we're from different generations, but I, I do find because I'm somewhat of a curmud- curmudgeon old man that there are certain things that we weirdly agree on. Um, but n- either way, I've just been calling him once a week and, you know, just shoot the shit. Sometimes it's for 10 minutes. Sometimes it's for an hour. Sometimes, you know, we'll go on forever. And like all of a sudden I realize the sun's down, it's dark out, but it, it's funny. Cause you know, I, I thought of it when we were talking earlier about the value of, of the, of older generations. And, you know, he's obviously retired. He spends a lot of his time, you know, the thing that he does to keep himself sharp is he plays poker online mostly for the last year, but then he would play, uh, and he, like, he wants to meet you so desperately. Cause I, anytime he talks about poker, I'm like, most of what I know from poker, I've learned from you, grandpa and from Thomas, and I need to get you two in a room. We need a poker um, episode where I can just talk about he, poker for an hour. Well, maybe we should get him on and interview him Ooh. and, and you, two, you, could, you can just like go back and forth. But anyway, you know, so I, I obviously steered away from politics and stuff, but I'll ask him about, you know, business stuff because he started his own successful business. I mean, he had a, um, you know, audio video shops that his his biggest rival at the time, or he was the biggest rival to Circuit City at the time, which is crazy to think about. Uh, so, you know, just kind of talking about that, like, what's your story? Like, tell me, I've got this thing going on in my work career. Like, do you have any advice? And I think it, you know, I, I doubt that he w- is now or will ever listen to this. Um, but you know, there, I, so, you know, what I'm saying is just, you know, for us, I guess, but I, uh, I find a lot of value in sort of connecting with him, uh, you know, sort of in the what he gives me, but I also just think that you know, it. I I enjoy the connection with somebody that like I haven't been connected with because we live in different parts of the state, and you know, we're just very different people. I mm. mean, in terms of, like the generational gap is so wide. So I would say just you know, call your grandparents, and you know, if not, if you have parents, call your parents. Uh, if not, find an old person that you can just <laughs> connect with. Well, even th- that's great. I mean, and and I would even say. If you don't have grandparents, find someone of their age, because even going back to what I was talking about with that generation, people who are retired in you know the last decade of their life, their perspective on productivity, on all this stuff will be so different. And uh, really, and and you know, for for a lot of them who feel might feel discarded from society, for just to have that conversation to be sought out gives them a sense of purpose and meaning. But then also they can speaking to us all of my grandparents have passed away um but um that is a great recommendation it is it's actually grandparents day at my daughter's school today which typically in the past they've had it in person tied into the school play for covid it's all over a virtual thing this year the the one piece of advice i will say for anybody who is going into this um especially if it's somebody you're not related to just be prepared to push through some uh you know some potentially problematic sure. uh <laughs> <laughs> uh, thoughts and feelings and, you know, pick your battles because there's a certain amount of things like I'm just not going to change his mind about. They were probably more progressive in their 30s than than the elder people of their generation. And when we're 70 and 80, we're going to think this, you know, the 20-year-olds are downright crazy. So you just got to have that perspective uh, that like – I know. You, you're not the smartest who's ever been in history. You might be, you know, more involved and enlightened in a lot of ways, but – you can always everything shifts that's great advice um yeah I'll, i i think uh i want to recommend nature just sort of inspired by our conversation it's funny even talking pass. about pass, pass. <laughs> not nature no, <laughs> no, no thanks <laughs> um even talking about our conversation of like redesigning the fire pit it's like i i i focused on that space because of the contemplative meditative space that it is and even thinking about I would love to know the science of this, maybe another day, of why we love to stare at fires. It's probably the same thing of why we love to stare at 
water and maybe even trees, there's something, the, the asynchronicity, something that is, there's part pattern, but there's also randomness and chaos of like a fire flickering or waves. If it was just the same motion and shape over and over, we lose interest. But because it's not, we can sort of stare into it. And it's really meditative. And I, I like to spend a lot of mornings by this little pond near our house. And I just sit there and just sort of stare at the water. And there's something about being in nature that's that really, I think, resists our productivity addicted kind of cultural uh, culture. And uh, it allows us to sort of embrace the stillness, the contemplation, and nature can do that because it's quiet, it's pretty, it smells good, it sounds good, usually smells good. Um, but then there's things like a fire or trees or water that taps into the brain that can we can get lost in. If you've got like, uh, there's an amazing nature preserve minutes from our house that we uh, started paying a you know a monthly membership too, so I just have access to these amazing trails and ponds and lakes and hiking and and uh, even you know maybe this is sort of you know bastardizing the whole point of this, but when when I'm in the middle of a creative project and need a break or need a reset, we've talked about this you know part of my creative process is to go on a hike because of how you know it can stir the brain. So you know, but the point is. Be in nature, not for what it can get you, not for productivity's sake, but for contemplation's sake. So nature. Yeah, I think that's good. And, you know, potentially would be an interesting episode. Are, have you, are you familiar with the idea of green therapy? Not by name, but... it's. The, I mean, sometimes people like, well, you know, I'm saying prescribe in quotes, cause, but it's like essentially therapists will assign you, like you need to go be surrounded oh, cool. by like green things, nature, because like grass doesn't count. Right. Yeah. And I, I wish I could sort of rattle off the top of my head, some of the things, cause I have read these interesting papers on it, the effects that it does have on your mind, mm. you know, and, and it like, even down to like the f- physiological level of like when our, when our, the green, uh, photoreceptors in our eyeballs are, you know, stimulated more the effects that it has on us, like in our mood and all wow. these things. And you know, if, if you want to pivot at some point, we'll just do a hard science episode. Uh, we, get all your- yeah, we need to get in the books. We need to talk about the science of nature and the science of heavy metal. Oh, my God. We are saving the shit show for episode 10. So uh, this is just Thomas here all by myself because Justin and I just recorded all the scripted segments and totally forgot to do an outro. Sorry, Justin, if you're listening to this with the rest of the world. Um, this is why podcasts don't make it past episode 10. All right, thanks for listening, everybody. I can't do the outro without Justin, so, you know, just find us on social media, online, email us, hey, at twofriendswithapodcast.com, at twofriendspod is our Instagram, and, um, you know, we'll see you next time. (laughs) What is wrong with me? I might not even hit record. Well, there's your problem right there. Like I hit record, but it's a, it's a, it's a double trigger. I got to press record and then play. So when I do, when I, when we did three, two, one record, like I'm wondering if I didn't even hit it properly so that like we, we didn't get anything. Oh, you fucker. That's, I've got 38 minutes. I'm just glad it's not me because if it was me, you would give me so much shit and say, this is what happens when you use windows products. It's true. It's true. It's, you know, probably. All right. Now I'm recording.